Welcome to Finding the Light. I'm Lizzie Oakes, and I've had an amazing opportunity to sit down with a number of people for heartfelt, real conversations about difficult times in their lives and how they got through. Jared Van Berkel is a media missionary filmmaker from Fantail Studios in Christchurch, and I'd caught up with Jared a while ago where we'd had coffee and he started to talk to me about some challenges that he'd been through in his life, really difficult times that had caused him to feel angry with God. I think it's a story that many of us can relate to. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So I did a, a three half hour episodes of the Hey Jared, it's really good to be able to uh, sit down today, so thank you, really thank good you. to catch up with you. Absolutely. Have a good conversation. Yeah. Now I just wanted to start with your life is a little bit unconventional, mm -hmm. I think. But random. But random. Yeah. Tell us a bit about your life, your family, the, the work that you do. Yeah, okay, so I am. my life is a little bit random and my roots are a little bit different. So when I was really young, I'm the youngest of three parents moved to Papua New Guinea when I was two and a half, became missionaries over there in Mount Hagen and Port Moresby. And as our sort of adventure in God and life grew, I ended up being homeschooled. I was homeschooled all the way through. And if you have met many homeschoolers, we all have a little bit of a unique bent to us. A bit uh, quirky. A bit quirky. And so that quirkiness has sort of stayed the whole way through and how I ended up progressing into being a television director, absolutely loved storytelling, all of those things, and did that through my early 20s. And then God spoke to me really clearly one day about becoming a pastor. Um, ended up sort of in the fetal position, bawling my eyes out. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> and, want to do that? <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily so much that I didn't want to do it, but it was the encounter with Jesus was so deep that it just was like this cathartic experience of, oh, I, I don't know how to respond. And so it, it was quite overwhelming. And I remember my wife coming home and I, I was crying and I was just saying to her, I've got to do this. And it wasn't in our plan at all. We'd been married for about six months and she'd married a television director. And all of a sudden there was going to be a big career change into pastoring. And I remember just saying, you know, how can I stand before God one day and have him say, well done, good and faithful servant, if the moment when he called me, I refused to answer. Mm. And so we ended up uh, moving and I became a pastor. I was a pastor for about 10 years. And then um, God spoke to me again in a dream and told me he wanted me to get back into media to launch a ministry, build a team of media missionaries and, and have a new adventure. And so I resigned from pastoring right after our first COVID lockdown, wow. which I thought was a bit of a crazy time to start a ministry. <laughs> and sounds like God though. It sounds like God. I reckon the, the worse the strategy, often the more God it's going to be because it's only going to work. Sink or swim, eh? Yeah, it's only going to work if it's him. And, and so now I, I lead a team of media missionaries and we make television shows about the love of God in action. And I've got an amazing wife and three incredible kids. Yeah. I'm interested to know what did your wife say when you told her <laughs> the next oh, change? She's my wife, Rihanna. She's pretty classic. Her general statement is, oh, that sounds so nice for you. <laughs> so once, once, you know, we were married for six months and, you know, went into pastoral ministry, we then had lots of like suddenly, it's like where God would speak and say, I want you to do this now. I want you to do this or I want you to give this away or I want you to trust me here and... And so for her and I, it's been a real growing journey of actually seeing God come through in so many different creative ways that now I'll ask you to pray into it. And she'll go, oh, what, has he spoken to you? Because if he has, then what's the point of having further conversation? Let's just get on with it. Let's wow. just do it and see what he does. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned that my parents were missionaries. What, what, I, what I hadn't seen was that when I was 13, my dad had a sudden asthma attack, mm -hmm. um, really mild asthmatic, had a sudden asthma attack, and that night he died. And th as you can imagine, as a young 13-year-old, it threw my life into absolute chaos. And my dad had often said to me, you know, Jared, the most important thing you'll ever have in life is your relationship with God. If you, you know, become the wealthiest person in the world, but you don't have that, you're, you're living in poverty. And after he passed away, um, 
I remember this thought being really prevalent in my mind was how could I be a godly man without a godly father to show me how? And the Bible talks about God being a father to the fatherless. And so I was presented then with this, basically this choice of, do I get upset and angry with God for letting my dad die? Or do I double down and throw myself into my relationship with him? I have a habit now where I go outside, I'll skip for 15 minutes, like with a skipping yeah. rope. Then I'll put on worship music and I'll hit a boxing bag for about 10 minutes because I have an agitation in my body. Yes. You know, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling worried. And so I need to give a physical release to help my body still. And in doing that, my mind begins to quiet and as I listen to the worship music. And so that's, you know, 10, 15 minutes skipping, 10, 15 minutes of boxing. And then I'll begin to pray. And, and I'll pray for 10, 15 minutes. And then I'll begin to feel the presence of God wrap around me. And I'll begin to feel an excitement. I'll begin to feel confidence. I'll begin to feel faith. And then in that space, um, I can then hear God speaking. Mm. Um, often I think we try to hear God speak, but we're, speak, we're, we're having our conversation from a, a place of fear. And angst. And, and angst. angst. And so all we're hearing is worry and concern our coming back, our own answers. But the yeah. Bible says to be still and know that he is God and he yeah. will strengthen you. Yeah. And so for me, being still actually requires a huge amount of physical activity to settle myself. Yeah, I hear what you're saying because it's like you have to sometimes just get yourself out of yeah, the way, don't you? And absolutely. I understand that feeling of sometimes feeling a bit anxious and yeah. I um, I don't tend to go boxing, but yeah. I'll go walking along the beach or I'll walk yeah, up hills absolutely. and get my heart rate up. And it's yeah. almost like you kind of purge yourself yeah, in a way, don't absolutely. you? I mean, there's often at nights where I'll be going to bed and like we're, whether we're needing a, a miracle at work or there's, you know, uh, my wife and I wanted to see something shift in a marriage. You know, we might have had a rhythm where just, we're just not functioning well together. We've got conflict. And so sometimes I'll just go for a run. And I'm like, Jesus, I just, I just need you. Mm. And I, I don't have any answers. I don't have any wisdom for this. And I'm just going to run. And I'm just going to run and listen to worship music until I begin to feel your presence come around me. Because I, I don't know what to do other than to ask for help mm. and to try and still my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can just go back, because really that dependency, you learned mm. it from a great loss in your life. Yeah, great loss. And, and, and can you tell us about that night of yeah. how your dad died? Mate, you know when people talk about, you know, everything that could go wrong went wrong. It was, it was 1999 and... We stayed up and had a, a family night. I was 13, watched a movie, went to bed around about 11 o'clock. It'd be two or three in the morning, I woke up because I could just hear chaos. I could hear yelling. And went through, because um, I hear my mum making noise. I've got an older brother and an older sister. My, uh, one of my siblings was downstairs on the telephone and I could tell they were relaying information to an ambulance. I went through to my mum's room and my dad was unconscious and he's had an asthma attack. and. And she, she was asking me, can, can you feel a pulse? And I was thinking, I mean, I've got, I've got no idea. I'm just, I've just walked into this environment. And so I thought, I'll, I'll pray. And I remember kneeling down next to his body, praying for him with a full expectation that God would heal him. Um, I had actually suffered for years from croup, which is like a, a breathing condition where your throat swells up. And, and I'd been ambulanced to hospital multiple times and nearly died. And... I got prayed for a year or two earlier and the power of God hit me. I fell over for the first time under the presence of God, got radically set free from that condition. I never had it ever again. And so I, I have this understanding that God is a God that heals. Sure. I'd had it in my own life. So there I am, 13, praying over my dad, fully expectant that God would, would heal him. And the ambulance came. They, were, they took for ever to arrive and then they came up the the main driveway we lived in the country but they missed the the proper turn off to our driveway and they went through the wrong gate drove through a paddock and they got stuck in the paddock at like three four in the morning so we had to get the neighbors tractor to be able to pull the ambulance out through the mud and uh the reality is dad had probably passed away by the time the ambulance got there anyway and they, you know they did everything that they could and at some point i was alone in my room i'd gone and got and changed out of my pajamas because I thought dad's going to be fine and I'm going to get a ride in an ambulance. Um, and then somebody came in and told me that he'd passed away and then, then walked off and, and left me there. And that was a real catalyst of trauma coming into my life, fear coming into my life. 
it's probably the first time now that I look back that I, I heard a demonic voice speaking to me and accusing me um, of not being a good enough Christian that, you know, God would have answered my prayers if I had had more faith. Right. Um, and that began to set loose a whole lot of anxiety um, and fear in my life. So whilst I have this teenage years where I'm radically pursuing God, I, I also have this flip side of, of trauma and, and needing inner healing, having fears and doubts. And I'm 36 now. And last year, I had a whole nother deep season of, of God ministering to me, bringing more things to the service that I thought had been dealt with. Just let years go down layer after layer after layer of of actually learning to trust God. Yeah. yeah. So I mean yeah. as that teenage boy it sounds like there was a, a lot of blame in there. Did you did you blame yourself? So basically well, the the thought that happened was that, you know, if you'd prayed better, um God would have answered your prayers. And it seems silly because you know, we know, you know, if, if you know the character of God and nature of God, you go, no, no, it's not, it's not about that. Mm. But in that, when we have trauma, we've got high vulnerability. Mm. And I remember for a couple of years fully believing that it was my fault and carrying this intense shame that if my mum knew that she would be ashamed of me and would blame me as well. And so I felt this intense pressure to keep it hidden. Wow. Um, and it wasn't until quite a few years went by where I was having um, some ministry time at church and someone was explaining that, you know, we have these trees in our life that bear fruit and that can be shame, it can be guilt, it can be anxiety. But if you trace the fruit into the branches, down the trunk, down to the roots, you can find that original moment where this began to grow. And, and it's that that we have to go after because I kept getting prayed for over and over and over and I'd feel better for a season but that fear, anxiety and guilt would always come back. You know, that's right. I, I remember a time before this. this you started, never had it before your dad Yeah, died. I never had it. There was something happened. Mm. And when I remember um, one day God gave me the revelation, it was like a full on flashback vision. And I saw the whole scenario play out like I was watching a 4K TV screen. And I watched everything happened like it was yesterday. And God showed me the exact moment where that thought got spoken into me about it being my fault. And it was a, it was a memory that I totally lost, but it came flooding back in technicolor. And I was like, there it is. Um, that was the moment God healed me. And uh, I had some people praying for me as that was all happening. And I actually began to manifest with a demonic spirit that had attached itself to my life had been the root of that fear and that shame and that guilt and that accusing voice. And, and I got set free and I had a deliverance moment. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, like you say, it's like the onion layer, isn't yeah. it? God goes around and, and deals with things and sometimes there's decades in between. Yeah, decades. But how was it for you, like, growing up without your dad? He was there. He obviously sounded a very present dad. And then, mm, and then yeah. you didn't have a dad. Yeah, I remember... It's funny. Because we, we talk about it like past tense but you keep having moments. Not like you're, oh, I grew through that and now as an adult, now it's okay. Um, I had a conversation with one of my kids last week who was saying, Dad, I'm really sad that I never got to meet your dad because when you tell stories, I have, no f I have no character or tone of voice to be able to put to those stories, mm. you know? And, and you get, man, I, I would have loved for my dad to meet my kids. Mm. Um, especially my wife, because I think they're very, very similar. And they're like chips off the old block, both in finance management, all of those things. So growing up without a dad, um, one of the things that was really significant, there were two men, um, Chris Diarth and Glenn Fraser, who were pastors in my community. Um, and they took me under their wing and, and they were youth pastors and kids pastors. And, and I just began to spend so much time with them. They were like, you know, they were only 15 years older than me, but when you're 13 or 14, someone 15 years old, it seems, you know, everybody's just big. Mm. And, and they began to be real surrogate fathers in, in some way. I mean, no one replaces your dad, you know, no. but it was enough to get me through those, through that time. And then, you know, the, the, the presence of God began to become real. Uh, I began to have dreams and visions. 
uh, as a family, we, we had a meeting. We, well, well, what are we going to do as a family? What's going to be our response? And so as a family, we decided that we would pray and fast every Monday. So you, your mum and your... And my brother and, and your, sister began okay. to pray and fast every Monday because we wow. went... I remember this conversation with mum. We were chatting about it and she said, I just feel like when Peter was with Jesus and all the disciples left Jesus and Jesus said to the disciples, will you go too? And Peter said, well, where, where can we go? And it's interesting when you, when you find yourself in deep grief, you know, what, what are my options? Do I, I turn away from God and then I have less than I have now? Or I throw myself into you, not knowing how you could have allowed this, totally confused now about your nature, totally confused to my level of trust with you. But what are, what are my scenarios? I'm, I'm going to have to trust that you're good, even though circumstances are telling me that you're not. Mm. Um, and his presence really began to grow in my life. But I still remember crying all the time, going, God, like, you're, you're growing in my life, but you're still not giving me a hug. And I think the more I experience Jesus, the less I need to know why, and the more I am satisfied with his presence being enough. You know, Paul says, I think, you know, my gra his grace is, is more than enough and it is but and sometimes it feels like it can be a lot of dedication to access that grace yeah you know to choose to choose to keep pursuing him to choose those things rather than choosing distraction yeah so I went to a friend of mine and said, tell me about what's going on. I began to tell him about all the miracles that God was doing and all the risks that I was taking. And look all, what I'm achieving. Look what I'm achieving. He said, man, that sounds like such an exciting faith adventure. I said, I know. He goes, yeah. It's a shame that you're actually making most of your decisions out of fear and not faith. Whoa. And I went, Ex excuse me? And he goes, all I've heard is somebody that's constantly trying to prove to God that they're good enough. And I went, Wow. And I started crying. Yeah. And uh, he said, I want you to go home and I want you to read the book of Romans. And I want you to write down every verse where it talks about God giving favor and grace when we don't deserve it. And so I did that over a couple of weeks, wrote down most of the book of Romans. And it was every time that I read it that my head said, yeah, that's true. But my heart said, that's rubbish. Mm. And I, I took it back and I began to read it to him. So this is just last year. And I'm reading these verses and in my head, I have this voice screaming, this is lies. It's all lies. God is not that good. He's not that good. It's not true. And we're having this conversation and I'm going, like, where do you think this is coming from? Your, your need to impress God. And I said, I don't know. I said, but randomly, I, don't, I can't explain this. I have this deep disappointment in me of, th you know, when I was 13, that God didn't heal my dad. And he said, OK, well, why don't you just start talking to God about this? And I was like, well, I'm in front of you. It's a bit weird, isn't it? He goes, no, just start talking to him. I said, okay, God, I'm, I'm disappointed that you didn't heal my dad. Because you know, I'm thinking, you know, I've dealt with this. I've, I've had deliverance. I've had freedom. And, you know, I've dealt with that anxiety and stuff years ago. He's like, carry on. I'm like, all right, God, I'm, you know, I'm disappointed that you didn't heal my dad when you could, you know, because let's be honest, you could have. Like life is yours to give or take and we could cut this any way you want, God. Mm. But I asked and for whatever reason, you said no. Mm. And everybody tells me that you're a really good, good father. I don't understand how a good father could look at someone praying in full faith in that moment and say no. And I never got angry. I had this realization, God, I never got angry with you because you're perfect and I'm not. So I wasn't allowed to be angry. Oh. Then all the stuff started bubbling up. You know, I wasn't allowed to be angry with you because you're perfect. So if anything's wrong, it can only be it's my all fault. It's all my fault. And then I, this, I said it, I didn't know it was there. And I said, ever since that day, I have earned through effort every answered prayer you've ever given me. And I, and I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was there, this driven need to perform, constantly trying to prove to God that I was good enough from this fear that if I wasn't, then he would stop answering my prayers, that his ability to answer my prayer was determined on how much I'd earned it. And this all came up. And then I began crying, going, God, you're mean. You're so mean. And then, this gets a little bit freaky. It's, you know, but, I'm all you know, good with freaky. All good freaky. 
I fell on the ground and this voice that was not my voice spoke through my mouth and this deep rumble going, God, I hate you. I hate you. And then God delivered me from the spirit of hate. And it was so explosive. I burst all these blood vessels in my left eye. I looked like the Terminator. Uh, I couldn't feel my legs from the waist down for the next quarter of an hour. And it was this explosive stuff where there had been this, 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 spirit that had attached to my life still then that moment of trauma that had been conditioning me for years that I had to earn God's love. Kind of like on your back. Yeah, with like whip. whipping, just keep, you've got to keep being better, keep being better. Be, like, and, and I would say to my wife at home sometimes, go, man, the only way I feel peace is knowing that I'm achieving more than I did the year before. Because I have no idea when is enough. And I don't know when is enough. All I know, as long as I'm doing better than everybody around me, I'm probably heading in the right direction. And she'd be like, gee, that sounds unhealthy. And I'm like, right, but I can't figure out another way. And it's just constantly there. I remember hopping in the car that day and I was, it brought up all this anger with God so much. Cause I was like, man, yeah, cause this- Cause you felt like you weren't allowed to be wasn't, angry. wasn't allowed to and be And now at last it was coming now out, Now it was right? coming out. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I remember God sitting, there's this intense presence of Father God in the car. It didn't feel like God all powerful and me like puny human. It just felt like two equal beings in the vehicle. It was this weird sensation. And I could feel him speaking into my heart saying, Jared, I'm just so pleased you're finally being honest with the elephant in the room. Don't you love that? You know, it, you know, we just have to stop there because, like, you know, so often Christians, we think we have to have it all together. Yeah. And, and like you say, be polite to God. And we're, yeah. we're, we're kidding ourselves. Yeah. And yet, you know, you could, you could have thought, well, he's just going to reject me now because yeah. I have just spewed all this stuff out. And that's yeah. not what a cr- Christian boy does. Yeah. And yet he said to you. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm so pleased we're finally being honest. So pleased and, and, we're finally being honest. And then he went on and said, look, don't, don't rush this. This is brought up a lot. Don't bottle it back down. I'm not concerned by how angry you are. And Say he that said, again. So don't, don't rush this. Don't bottle it back down. I'm not concerned by how angry you are. Let this process through in its own course. Let it run its course. And when you're ready to talk, I'll be here. Wow. And, then and that next, was only last year? That was last year. And then the, yeah. next, the day after that, I was driving to work and, and uh, I ended up having to pull over because God began speaking again. He just said, Jared, you've been living your life with so much pressure to prove yourself, to prove to me that you're the perfect son. What we're going to do now is we're going to reverse the script and I'm going to prove to you that I'm the perfect father. Yeah. And, I, and I just broke and pulled over. And it's quite... And I get emotional just thinking about it because it, it brought up. Because you go, well, that's a phenomenal moment, but you don't have a phenomenal moment. And then all of a sudden, all your thinking transforms. You know, I've had to keep going back to that because I have multiple opportunities to pick that whip back up, mm. you know, and to go back into that driven nature because I've had 20 plus years of being conditioned with that way of thinking. Yeah. And so I've been going layer after layer in these conversations with God going, well, I've got to keep doing this because if I don't, I, I, I could fail. Mm. And, he, and he'll say things like, and? Love and I, I'm like, what? you're allowed to fail. I'll, I'll fail. Because, well, what would be so bad about failing? And I was like, everything. Everything would be God about it's what would I built be my wrong. Life on. You know, we 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 win. He's like, yeah, we do win. What does winning look like? And I go, it looks like not failing. He goes, no, it doesn't. Like the winning looks like something, Jared. What is it? I'm like, oh, what what is it? He goes, well, you should know if you want to win. And I go in these conversations. He goes, Jared, winning looks like enjoying my presence, the closeness that I have with God, and and how much that is worth to me now. And what is built into my life is such a treasure. Yeah, they, they talk about the treasures of darkness, right? Yeah. There's some treasures you can only find through yeah. going through the dark. Right? Yeah, and I've just, I just find that when we're in our darkest moments, man, the God's grace, the Holy Spirit's comfort, it's a comforter, it just increases. And I, I just find the, the more I find myself broken in Jesus' hands, just the more... Oh, I don't want to sound cliche, but just the more real that he is mm. and the less the, super, the superficial things in life seem to matter. Life begins to get clearer and the big picture is more obvious. And, you know, you just go, actually, yeah, life just gets simpler. And life gets better. Life gets better. Yeah, life gets better. Not always easier. No. 
but richer, deeper, more meaningful. Yeah. So good to chat today, Jared. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Lizzie. I was really touched by my conversation with Jared. So great to actually sit down with him and he's so honest and real about the journey he's been through and how he felt. It was a very real and raw conversation. And I think Jared showed us that sometimes in life we do actually get angry with God. And we can be honest about that stuff. We can bring it to God and dialogue and chat with him about it. And he's not afraid of those things in our lives that we might think uh, stop him from wanting to have a relationship with us. So encouraging to have this conversation. See you next time on Finding the Light.